first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the organizer for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present you the state of the art on where we are in the treatment of uh, star-planet interaction, both on uh, the point of view of uh, gravitational interaction and the one of uh, electromagnetic uh, interaction. So during the coming 20 minutes, I will try to give you what we know, what we're able to model, but also where are the most important challenges we have to address in the coming years to study planetary system and star planet system as a whole. So, first of all, the general context, this is the context of this uh, conference. We have a revolution in astrophysics with the discovery of uh, exoplanets since uh, 20 years now. And thanks to this revolution, we have new planetary systems. And we have also, thanks to some mission like Coro, Kepler, and in the near future, Keops, Tess, and Plato, the characterization of the host star. And we will see that the host star have also a, a very important uh, influence on the surrounding system. So when you are interested in dynamics, as this is my case, you want to understand the evolution of the rotation of both the star and the planet. Also, what has been uh, presented by uh, Olivier Grasset yesterday, what is important is when you will have some interaction, you have possible heating in the planet, and this is important for the emergence of life. And also, you want to understand the orbital architecture. For example, this system, Kepler-11, I like to show it as an example because you can see that you have six planets but they are, in fact, in a distance to the star that correspond roughly to the, to the orbit of Mercury. So you can see that you can have very closed system where all the interaction, both gravitational and uh, electromagnetic, will, have, uh, will play a key role. So, in fact, to, to set the stage, we want to understand system in interaction. And if we go back to our daily life, we have everyday example of the two main interactions with radiation of the star and the moon in the case of, uh, of the Earth. The first one is a gravitational interaction which will lead to tidal interaction between planets, their moons, if any, and the star. And it will give, it will give angular momentum transfer, transfer between the components and it will modify the rotational and the orbital evolution. And then, if you have magnetic field, this is the case of most low mass stars, of course. And if you have magnetic field in the planet, you will have electromagnetic interaction. And we have the case of the Earth, when because, where because of the interaction between the sun, the sun, the solar wind, and the magnetic field of the Earth's magnetosphere, you can have such a phenomena as we see in, uh, in the pole. So what is the state of the art from the physical point of view of the modeling of uh, this interaction? In fact, in many studies, the bodies are treated as point mass objects or solid, and we adopt ad hoc prescription for tides, winds, or electromagnetic interaction. But what is very interesting is that if you look at the different body, here, here you have the stars, here you have the planets, all of them have very different, strongly different structures. Look at the case of the star, for example, very low mass stars are completely convective. That means that in these bodies, all the, the, all the heat transport is, is due to convection. If you go to the case of the sun, you have an external convective envelope, and inside you have, you have what we call a radiative core, where the transport of energy is, uh, is ensured by radiation. And if you go to higher mass stars, then you revert the internal structure and the external part is radiative and the internal part is convective. If you go to more differentiated body, going to high mass star, from high mass star to low mass star, then you have gaseous giant planets with convective envelope and a possible rocky icy core. Then you have the intermediate mass icy giant planet. You can have icy bodies like the one presented by Olivier yesterday. And finally, you have telluric planet. And you understand that this internal structure and the corresponding dynamics will strongly modify the response to the different uh, forcing coming from the star or the moon. And thus, we need an abinocio for physical modeling. 
Let us begin with tides. When you have tides, you have tidal waves, both in fluid, liquid and gas, and also in the rocky icy part. If you look at the fluid part, because you have an elongation because of the tide of the body in the direction of the perturber, you will have an hydrostatic adjustment of the body, and this will give rise to large-scale displacement. On the other hand, you can look at a fluid body with a tidal perturber as a forced oscillator, and you have given oscillation of the body. The first one is what we call the inertial waves. They are also called Rossby waves in geophysics. These are waves which are ensured by the Rossby, by the Coriolis acceleration due to the rotation of the star or the planet. If you are stably stratified, that means that the layer is not convective, you will have the Archimedean force. This is a case of the Earth's ocean. And then this will give you gravity waves. And thus, if you combine with the action of rotation, you will have gravito-inertial waves. Acoustic waves are at higher frequencies than the forcing, and thus they are negligible for tidal, uh, tidal uh, waves. Do we see some signature of uh, these tidal flows elsewhere than in the Earth? Of course, in planets, we see some uh, tidal waves, but also in stars. Here you can see the case of a binary star. It's uh, one, around 1.5 solar mass stars. And you can see in the power spectrum of oscillation of these stars, some peaks, and these are tidal oscillation in stars. For the rocky part, you will have a large-scale displacement in the rocky part, and you will have seismic eigenmodes that can be excited by tides. So what is very important for tidal interaction is that you will have potential energy, which is linked to the gravitational tidal potential. You convert it into kinetic energy, and because of the internal structure, you have dissipation. Then you have system evolution, both for the spin and the orbit. For example, you will circularize, in a given case, the orbit. You will make the spin become aligned. And as in the case of the moon, you will synchronize the spin with the orbital motion. And what is important is to understand this friction. Very often in the literature, you will uh, meet the quality factor. The quality factor corresponds to a forced oscillator. If the quality is high, the dissipation is weak, and so the evolution, tidal evolution, will be negligible. If the quality is low, you have a high dissipation and a strong tidal evolution. So you can say, OK, but if I have this factor, I can parameterize it, and we will be very happy to compare that with observation. Look at this example of Mars Phobos system. So Mars is, of course, treated here as a solid. And then the quality factor has a smooth dependence on the orbital frequency. And what you can see, depending on the power law you adopt, is that when you look at the semi-major axis evolution as a function of time, you have a different evolution as a function of this power law. And so that means that you have to constrain that power law to have the correct evolution. But now, replace the solid mass by a purely fluid convective mass and looking at the tidal response of this planet. It will be fluid, so you will have a resonant response of the fluid body, like the Earth's ocean. And when you simulate here the evolution, going through this dissipation that strongly depends on the frequency, you get a highly, a highly erratic evolution. And you see here that dissipation in fluid and rocky part cannot be treated with the same formalism. And this is one of the challenges. Case of the Earth. We are speaking a lot about exoplanets. Imagine you look at the Earth for the tidal dynamics as an exoplanet. So you don't have the space, re the space resolution. And so you can say it's a rocky planet. Yes, but in fact, tidal dissipation in the Earth is ensured by the thin oceanic layer. Here you can see a map of the intensity of the, of the tide. And most of the tidal dissipation is due to this very thin layer. So you have always to be very careful on what we, what we adopt for tidal dissipation. And in fact, 20% of the dissipation in the Earth is ensured here in the, in the west of the, in the east of the Atlantic Ocean. And here you can see the kinetic energy of the tidal waves in the Biscay Bay just close to, to here. But what is interesting is that if you go to astronomical time scale, look at what happens if you integrate in the past the evolution of the Earth-Moon system going so from the present position of the, of the moon. 
If you adopt a Haddock constant tidal dissipation, you obtain a moon that is too young, and this is always the result. But if you take a realistic tidal dissipation based on the physics of oceanic waves, then you are able to get realistic order of magnitude for the age of the moon. So we need to have a stratified information for planets. Look at giant planets. Recently, we have signature of strong tidal dissipation in Saturn, 10 times higher than what was admitted just before. And this has very important consequences for the moon, for example. Thanks to such type of strong dissipation, you are able to place the moon at the right position with a scenario where you create the moon thanks to an initial massive ring. And if you believe this scenario, there is other scenario, it allows you to reproduce the surfacic chemical properties of the moon. So once again, internal structure is a key actor. And then if you go to hot Jupiter system with a solar type star and a hot Jupiter just close to, the, to this star, you have some signature of tidal interaction. Here you have the inclination of the spin of the star relatively to the orbital plane. And you see that for low mass star with a C convective envelope, the obliquity is weak, while for hotter star, which have only a thinner convective envelope, it's not weak. It's, uh, it could be very important. But what you see when you compare all the observations is that tidal dissipation varies with the mass, the age, and the dynamics of the star. So that means that you have to have a physical treatment for that. Then going to, I will make a brief review of the different mechanisms and where do we start. For convective region, you have turbulence, like the surface of the sun, and this turbulence will exert a viscous friction on tidal waves. In stable stratified layer, like in the atmosphere, it will be simply the heat diffusion. And depending on the structure, it will give you different tidal dissipation. Look at this example for stars on giant planets. You can have a forced oscillator. The restoring force is a Coriolis acceleration or the stratification and the dumping is due to viscosity or thermal diffusivity. Here you have 3D velocity field of the equilibrium tide, the first one I described to you. Here you have the rotation, here's the axis where the perturber is, and you see a 3D velocity field, and thanks to acceleration, Coriolis acceleration, it will excite inertial waves driven by the rotation, and this gives you this kind of structure, which is called attractor, and here you have a strong shear in the velocity field, and that leads you a very efficient dissipation. And when you look at the spectrum of dissipation, you see a large number of peaks, as I described before. Can we understand this spectrum? The answer is yes. If you admit that you can have a reduced model of tidal dissipation in a, in a fluid, you can look at a local box. And then, one again, when you look at the dissipation spectrum, you get the same behavior. And what is interesting is not the equation, is that thanks to this small model, we have been able to derive what we call scaling laws, describing the number of peaks, the height of the peaks, so the height of the resonance, their width, and also the strength of the equilibrium tide, and it's matched well with global numerical simulation. And you have here a regime diagram where you have inertial waves dis dissipated by viscosity, and here gravity waves dissipated by heat diffusion. So we begin to have a clear picture of what happened in such complex system and to be able to tackle them in the treatment of star planet dynamics. Here you have also the question. You have a star planet system and you want to know what is the star which will dissipate the more tidal energy. Here we have looked at the low mass star, which are hosting planets, along the evolution. Along the evolution of this star, you have a radiative core which will grow during the, during the evolution and stop at a given point on the main sequence. Here, this is a, what we call the hirschsprung russell diagram. Here, the star is completely convective and then this radiative core grows. The main idea of this slide is to show you that, in fact, tidal dissipation by this wave in convective envelope is dependent of the aspect ratio between the convective envelope and the total radius and the mass of the central radiative core. And you have a maximum. And in fact, the star has some evolutionary track, as in this diagram, in this tidal diagram. And you see that K-type star, which, are, which have a lower mass than the sun, will stop close to the maximum. The sun will be here, the F-type star will be here, and the M-type star will create a, a radiative core, and then which will disappear. 
And so when you look at the evolution of a mean dissipation along the edge of the star, you see that you have a bump for a strong increase of the tidal dissipation, and then it will stop at the asymptotic value on the main sequence, where the star is converting hydrogen to helium, and depending on the mass, it will decrease by several order of magnitude, and this is what is shown by observation. Tied in giant core of planets, in the, giant, in the core of giant planets, we know from Cassini, for example, that you can have 18 Earth's masses at the center of Saturn. Okay. And then the idea is to say we have some difficulties with only fluid parameter, fluid dissipation to explain tidal dissipation. What happens if we make a ab initio modeling of tides in such layer? And this is what we do, taking into account the action of the deep atmosphere surrounding the core. And then we have been able to match the strong dissipation observation thanks to this ab initio modeling, which is better than what was previously admitted. That means people calibrated tidal dissipation saying, if I wish that the moon is here after four billion years, I have to have this dissipation. And it doesn't work compared to the observation. Now, if you go to the physical point of view, looking at the internal structure, being aware of all the in we have for this, uh, this planetary layers, we are able to make some prediction at fixed physics and to compare them to observation. This is the same that can be done here in Nantes by Gabriel Toby and collaborators. Here you have the tidal quality factor, which is computed as a function of the fraction of ice or silicates in the planet you are looking at, and you can see that you have a difference of order of magnitude depending on the composition. And this is that point, very important point for planetary interiors. This is a need of very good equation of state to tell you what is fluid, what is ice, where you have ice, where you have a uh, rocky, rocky part. And finally, we have been able also, we are now able to construct global model of tidal dissipation for planets that both, that both have a rocky part and a fluid part. And in most of the case, for example, for giant planets in this graph, I, I don't have the time to describe it, we have been able to demonstrate that you have to take into account both the rocky part and the fluid layer uh, together at the same time. And the case of the Earth is showing us that this is also the through, the through for telluric planets. Now you have a magnetic environment around the stars. Um, you have, for example, stellar winds. For example, in the sun, it's due to the coronal lifting. And you can have, in the early phase of uh, stellar evolution, the accretion, the interaction between the star and the accretion. Going to star-planet interaction, what is very important is this point I want to show you, is that you will have, if you, you have a surface which is called, it will, it will match, the halfen uh, surface. The halfen surface is the surface where the speed of the wind is equal to the halfen frequency that corresponds to the strength of the magnetic field of the star. And if the planet is inside this halfen uh, surface, it will be able to directly, to directly interact thanks to magnetic interaction with the stars. And you can create such type of structure called the Alven wing. And here what is shown to you is the angular momentum flux intensity. Here you have a, star, you have a planet like Venus with a small, with a small uh, where you don't have a strong dynamo action. And you can see that you have a transfer of angular momentum from the planet to the star because of an induced magnetosphere. Here you have the case of a planet like the Earth with a magnetosphere. And then you see a different structure where you have some transfer to the star, but also to the wind. And now we have been able to compute scaling laws also, like in tides, for this type of interaction. And what we can see in this diagram showing the different evolution. Here you have the spin of the, of the star in the mean orbital motion. If you take only into account tides, you will predict a given final state. But if you take into account what happened to the star, it lost angular momentum thanks to the wind. It will be described by uh, Florent Gallet uh, in his talk. Then you have a completely different evolution, and thus that means that at the present state of the art, we have to take into account both tides and magnetic interaction. And for the evolution of the star, 
it will also modify, it could modify the evolution of the star. For example, if you look at a solar type star, because of the waves, you are exciting by tides. For example, a hot Jupiter, you can transport angular momentum into the star. And when you transport angular momentum into the star, you modify the internal shear. And when you modify the shear, it's like in the atmosphere, you can modify the profile of chemical composition and thus the evolution of the star. The last point is that you have some system like Tobu, where the presence of the hot Jupiter has been suspected to modify the magnetic activity of the star because of tidal flows I presented before that are able to modify the generation and the stability of magnetic field. And these two topics are completely new research field. And here, this is the take home message with the most important question about tidal dissipation variation in star and planet as a function of the structure, the revolution state, the relative importance of tide and magnetic interaction. You have seen that we have to take into account both of them. And finally, the evolution of the orbital architecture and consequences for habitability. And I thank you for your attention.